Have you ever heard of someone going to extreme lengths to conceal a terrible secret? Imagine finding yourself in a situation where you have to hide a murder. How far would you go to cover it up? How did we get here? What brought us to this point of no return? Welcome back to FTO True Crime. My name is Bill. And to uncover this deadly secret, we need to rewind. Back to the day of August 10th, 2023, in Zanesville, Muskingum County, Ohio. Debbie and Tom lived together on Sandhurst Drive in Zanesville, Muskingum County, Ohio. Their relationship had been a tumultuous, on-again, off-again affair for years. Despite the significant age difference between them, Tom was well known in the community for his willingness to lend a helping hand to those in need. Tom first met Debbie at Kroger, where they both worked until Tom's recent retirement. Their home on Sandhurst Drive was a testament to their shared life. Valentine's Day cards, cookbooks, and countless mementos that spoke of their time together. Things changed on August 10th, 2023. At 1.26 p.m., the Zanesville Police Department received a frantic 911 call from Debbie Frazier. She claimed that she had just arrived at her boyfriend's home to find the house ransacked and the door ajar. While on the line with 911, Debbie suddenly screamed that there were men in the house. The operator then heard the chilling sound of a quiet gunshot, followed by Debbie's anguished cries that she had been shot. Immediately, all available officers from the Zanesville Police Department rushed to the scene. Chief Scott Comstock was the first to arrive, closely followed by patrolman Brian Wolfe and Logan Miller. The officers found Debbie in the entryway, clutching her leg, which was bleeding profusely from a gunshot wound. Her face was pale, contorted in pain, and her voice trembled as she tried to explain what had happened. They came out of nowhere, she cried. Masked men, they shot me and ran. The panic in her eyes was palpable, reflecting the chaos that had just unfolded. Patrolman Byron Bollinger sprang into action, kneeling beside Debbie to apply a tourniquet to her leg. His hands moved swiftly yet gently, his training kicking in as he worked to stem the flow of blood. As he reassured her, the distant wail of approaching sirens grew louder, a promise of help on the way. Debbie was then carefully lifted onto a stretcher and whisked away to the hospital, leaving behind a scene of disarray and unanswered questions. Next to where Debbie had fallen, officers found a 22 caliber revolver, a small but deadly piece of evidence. Its presence raised immediate questions. Had it been used by the assailants, or was there more to the story than Debbie had revealed? Detective Brian Ruff arrived, his sharp eyes taking in every detail. As the lead investigator, it was his job to piece together the truth from the fragments of chaos left behind. He began methodically directing the officers, ensuring that the scene was preserved and evidence meticulously collected. The officers then moved through the house, each room silent and foreboding. In the bedroom, patrolman Logan Miller made a discovery that sent a chill through the entire team. There, hidden away as if in a macabre attempt to erase his existence, was the body of Thomas Waddell. He was wrapped tightly in trash bags, duct tape, and a comforter, a gruesome bundle that spoke volumes of a desperate effort to conceal a crime. The discovery of Thomas's body turned the investigation on its head. The masked intruders Debbie described seemed less plausible as the primary culprits, and the officers began to question the narrative she had given. As they continued their search for clues, the tangled web of relationships and secrets between Debbie and Thomas slowly began to unravel, hinting at motives and mysteries that stretched far beyond the initial 911 call. With each piece of evidence collected, the story grew more complex, painting a picture of a relationship fraught with tension and hidden dangers. The Zanesville Police Department now faced the daunting task of sifting through the lies and uncovering the truth behind the tragic events of that August afternoon. 
At the scene, several details immediately raised questions. Thomas Waddell's apartment was well-kept and orderly, a stark contrast to the chaotic scene Debbie Fraser had described. There were no signs of drug use or drug sales, which typically accompany home invasions. Instead, the supposed ransacking appeared more like superficial mess-making, as if someone had gone through the motions without genuine intent. Officers noticed torn photographs of Debbie and Thomas scattered on the floor a poignant and troubling detail that hinted at personal turmoil rather than a random attack. Despite the disarray, nothing of value seemed to be missing. Numerous firearms were still in place, untouched, items that would likely be prime targets in a typical home invasion. The scene contradicted Debbie's account, deepening the mystery and suggesting that the true story lay beneath the surface. The officers knew they had to look closer, beyond the obvious, to uncover what had really happened that fateful night. According to assistant coroner Greg Jadwin, it was evident that Waddell had been deceased for some time. The urgency of the situation prompted Licking County forensic pathologist, Dr. Jeff Lee, to request Waddell's body be transported to his office immediately and in the same condition it was found, still wrapped in the comforter and bags. This would enable Dr. Lee to more accurately determine the time of death and gather crucial forensic evidence. As Detective Ruff surveyed the scene, he faced several daunting challenges. What initially seemed like a straightforward home invasion now unfolded into a complex murder investigation. Inconsistencies surrounded the entire situation, casting doubt on the narrative presented by Debbie Frazier. The pieces of the puzzle didn't quite fit together, leaving Ruff and his team with more questions than answers. After meticulously processing the scene, Detective Ruff orchestrated his investigation, delegating tasks to various detectives. Some were assigned to conduct witness interviews and gather surveillance footage in hopes of uncovering evidence of a home invasion. Meanwhile, he dispatched Detective Jimmy Duvall to interview Frazier once again, aiming to delve deeper into her account of events. Furthermore, Ruff made the critical decision to have a detective administer a gunshot residue, GSR, test on Frazier. The mere mention of this test seemed to unsettle Frazier, prompting her to alter her story. Suddenly she claimed to have touched the gun that shot her, a significant deviation from her previous narrative. This response was precisely why Ruff had ordered the GSR test. While GSR would naturally be present on anyone who had been shot, a guilty individual might attempt to manipulate their story if they believed forensic evidence could incriminate them. Frazier's sudden change in testimony only heightened suspicions and underscored the importance of gathering every possible piece of evidence in this perplexing case. Finally, after careful consideration, Detective Ruff and Detective Sergeant Phil Michael began drafting warrants to search for evidence at the scene. One of the first items they focused on was Debbie Frazier's iPhone, which was found at the scene of the incident. Within a day of the initial 911 call, Michelle made a significant discovery, deleted searches on Frazier's phone. Among them was a query made at 8.16 a.m. on August 10th just five hours before the frantic call to emergency services. The search read, How long does GSR stay on skin? This revelation raised eyebrows and added another layer of suspicion to the case. Following this discovery, the detectives returned to the hospital to interview Frazier once more. During questioning, Frazier claimed she had spent the entire night with her other boyfriend, John Anderson, before returning to Waddell's apartment. This new piece of information further complicated the investigation, leaving the detectives with a myriad of questions. Upon learning about Frazier's other boyfriend, detectives Michelle and Devol wasted no time tracking down John Anderson. Anderson was stunned to discover that his on-again, off-again girlfriend of 10 years had been living with another man. According to Anderson, Frazier had led him to believe that she worked as a live-in nurse, providing care for Thomas Waddle, 
whom she falsely claimed was a dementia patient. This revelation shattered Anderson's trust and added another layer of deception to Frazier's already complex web of lies. Anderson, feeling betrayed and bewildered, cooperated fully with the investigation. He granted permission to search his phone, eager to uncover any clues that might shed light on Frazier's motives and actions. During the interview, Anderson recounted an unusual interaction with Frazier. She had recently asked him to leave a voicemail for Waddell, pretending to be an agent from PNC Bank. In the text messages he provided, Frazier explained that Waddell was experiencing Alzheimer's symptoms and his granddaughter was attempting to communicate something important to him. This revelation painted a disturbing picture of Frazier's manipulation and deceit, suggesting a calculated effort to control and exploit Waddell's vulnerabilities for her own gain. As the investigation delved deeper, it became increasingly clear that Frazier's web of lies extended far beyond her relationships and into the heart of a sinister plot with deadly consequences. Anderson provided a detailed account of the events unfolding on the evening of August 9th through the early hours of August 10th. He recalled Frazier contacting him, clearly upset and in need of a distraction. Sensing her distress, Anderson agreed to take her for a drive around Muskingum County, hoping to provide some comfort. Throughout the drive, Frazier remained visibly upset, yet she seemed unwilling to discuss the source of her distress. They made a stop at the BP on North Point to grab some refreshments before heading to Blackhand Gorge for a walk. However, during their time there, Frazier unexpectedly requested to be left alone, adding to Anderson's confusion and concern. Undeterred, they continued their journey, eventually arriving in the Dresden area. There, Frazier abruptly walked off, claiming she needed to speak with a counselor. Anderson's account painted a picture of a troubled and erratic evening, leaving more questions than answers about Frazier's state of mind and the events leading up to the tragic incident at Waddell's apartment. Detectives Ruff and Michelle wasted no time in initiating the process of obtaining search warrants for a wide array of records. They sought access to phone records, email correspondence, Apple records, and financial transactions, recognizing the importance of gathering every possible piece of evidence in the investigation. In total, more than 20 warrants and court orders were issued, each aimed at uncovering crucial data and records that could shed light on the events leading up to Thomas Waddle's murder. As the detectives worked tirelessly to gather evidence, Licking County forensic pathologist Dr. Jeff Lee provided his findings regarding Waddle's time of death. Dr. Lee's conclusions were sobering. Waddle had been murdered approximately four hours after 9 p.m. on August 9, 2023, the very evening before the home invasion call. This revelation underscored the urgency of the investigation, as it became increasingly clear that the timeline of events was crucial in piecing together the truth behind this tragic case. Zanesville police patrolmen diligently canvassed the neighborhood, going door to door to interview neighbors in an effort to gather any information about potential assailants fleeing the apartment complex. They also sought out security footage from nearby homes and businesses, hoping to catch a glimpse of any suspicious activity. Ultimately, the officers obtained multiple ring camera videos and security footage from local establishments. They even went as far as retrieving security footage from all seat buses operating in the city. Despite their exhaustive efforts, however, no witness or video footage could provide any description of individuals fleeing the apartment complex, deepening the mystery surrounding the case. At the ZPD evidence facility, Detective Gary Moore meticulously lifted latent prints off a television that had been placed on the floor of Waddell's bedroom. After analysis, BCI analyst Jerry Lanfear made a significant discovery. The prints matched those of David Eugene Grantham from Tavares, Florida. Grantham fit the description of the home invader, a white male. 
and had a history of theft and receiving stolen property. Excited by this potential breakthrough, detectives quickly followed up with authorities in Tavares, Florida, hoping to track down Grantham. However, their investigation took an unexpected turn when they learned that Grantham could not have been the perpetrator. Shockingly, they discovered that Grantham had passed away in February 2021, found dead in his apartment by his roommate, none other than Deborah Frazier. His death had been ruled an accidental overdose, casting doubt on his involvement in the case and adding yet another layer of complexity to the unfolding mystery. Detectives pressed on with their investigation, delving deeper into the financial and phone records in search of crucial clues. When the records were finally returned, Detective Sergeant Michel and FBI Special Agent Brian Lacey wasted no time in analyzing the phone data. Using advanced techniques, Lacey meticulously mapped out the movements of Anderson, Frazier, and Waddell based on their phone signals. Lacey's analysis corroborated Anderson's account of picking up Frazier at the Sandhurst Apartments. He successfully traced their journey as they traveled north into the county and eventually reached Blackhand Gorge. However, a chilling revelation emerged. Waddell's phone abruptly disappeared from the tracking data and never reactivated, adding another layer of intrigue to the already complex investigation. Anderson and Fraser's phones were meticulously tracked back and forth between the Sandhurst area and Dresden, weaving a complex web of movements throughout the county. The digital trail ultimately led to Fraser being dropped off at Sandhurst between 11 a.m. and noon on August 10th, further solidifying the timeline of events. Meanwhile, financial records revealed a troubling discovery. Waddell and Fraser shared a PNC bank account and its balance had been significantly depleted to just $2,000. This finding raised red flags and hinted at potential financial impropriety. Detective Michel unearthed further damning evidence when he discovered that Frazier had created a fake email account. Using this alias, she had sent herself messages resembling communications from a fraud claims representative discussing a situation of alleged fraud with Waddell as the victim. Deleted Google searches on her phone included queries for a PNC logo and information on bank fraud. The implications of these findings were profound. It appeared that Frazier may have misused funds from her shared account with Waddell and was now attempting to cover her tracks with elaborate deception. The detectives were left with the daunting task of untangling this web of deceit to uncover the truth behind Frazier's actions and her potential involvement in Waddell's murder. Detective Sergeant Michel delved deeper into Frazier's phone using forensic software, uncovering a series of deleted searches that sent chills down his spine. August 5th, how to load a gun. August 6th, how to load a revolver pistol. Will a gun fire the wrong ammo? And how to know what ammo your gun uses? August 9th. How to uncock the hammer on a revolver? What does 22 ammo look like? And worst place to get hit in the head? These disturbing searches painted a damning picture, suggesting premeditated intent and a cold-blooded determination to carry out a violent act. With each search, the questions surrounding the homicide of Thomas Waddle shifted from whether Frazier had committed the crime to whether she had acted alone. The results of forensic testing in the case provided crucial evidence, helping to demonstrate conclusively that Frazier had acted alone in the tragic events that unfolded at Waddle's apartment. The pieces of the puzzle were finally falling into place, bringing closure to a case shrouded in darkness and deceit. Detective Ruff submitted the trash bags and duct tape that had been used to wrap Mr. Waddle's body for DNA testing. The results were conclusive. Only the DNA of Frazier and Waddle was present on these items. Additionally, two Velcro straps that had been attached to Waddle's body and used to drag him across the apartment were also submitted for testing. Once again, 
the DNA returned only to Frazier. Further incriminating evidence emerged when Frazier's hair was discovered in the duct tape used to secure the trash bags to Thomas Waddle's feet. During the investigation, a zipped-up book bag was found near the front door of the apartment when Frazier made the 911 call. Inside the bag was a single glove. Detectives recognized the potential significance of this discovery, especially as the second glove was missing. The glove was tested for DNA, which matched Frazier. More importantly, it tested positive for gunshot residue, residue from the murder, not from the shooting incident on the 10th when the glove was sealed inside the book bag. These pieces of evidence painted a damning portrait, pointing unmistakably to Frazier's involvement in the murder of Thomas Waddell. With each revelation, the case against her grew stronger, leaving little doubt as to her guilt. Regarding the firearm, ATF trace information revealed that Thomas Waddell had purchased the weapon in 1990. Further analysis by BCI analysts determined that two fired cartridges from the revolver were found at the scene. Remarkably, these cartridges were consistent with both the injury suffered by Waddell and the injury sustained by Frazier. Additional information surfaced, corroborating the conclusion that Frazier acted alone in the crime. It became evident that many others had been deceived by her manipulation and lies. Frazier had a history of elaborate deceptions, carefully calculated to either garner attention or portray herself to her victims as someone in need of assistance. These revelations painted a disturbing picture of Frazier's character, exposing a pattern of deceit and manipulation that extended far beyond the events of the case. As the investigation unfolded, it became increasingly clear that Frazier's actions were driven by a dangerous combination of cunning and deception, leaving a trail of destruction in her wake. In June of 2023, Frazier concocted a disturbing tale of being attacked by a man wearing a hoodie while at Dillon State Park. She reported the supposed crime to Waddell and the authorities, spinning a web of deceit that included fabricating the existence of a counselor she claimed to have been meeting at the park. Investigators soon uncovered the extent of her deception, revealing that she had even created a fake telephone number to text herself as Vivian, the supposed counselor from BetterHelp. The false report was not an isolated incident. In fact, it wasn't the first time Frazier had manufactured such an allegation. Similar to her 2023 claim, she had falsely reported being attacked back in 2014, showcasing a troubling pattern of deceit and manipulation. These revelations painted a incriminating picture of Frazier's character, highlighting her propensity for elaborate fabrications and manipulation to suit her own agenda. It became increasingly clear that her actions were not merely impulsive or misguided, but were part of a calculated pattern of deceit, leaving a trail of chaos and false accusations in her wake. Deborah L. Frazier, age 36, stood before Common Pleas Judge Mark C. Flegel on March 18, 2024, and pleaded guilty to murder with a firearm specification, tampering with evidence, and gross abuse of a corpse. According to her confession, after days of meticulous planning, on the evening of August 9, 2023, Deborah Frazier approached Thomas Waddell as he sat in his recliner. With cold precision, she raised his 22 caliber pistol, took aim at the back of his head, and callously executed him in his own living room. Following the heinous act, Frazier embarked on a desperate attempt to cover up her crime, resorting to dramatic but ultimately unsuccessful measures. In late March 2024, Deborah Frazier received her sentence, life in prison with the possibility of parole after 23 years, as stipulated in her plea agreement. Thanks for watching. Please consider leaving a comment sharing your thoughts and insights. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more in-depth analyses and discussions on a wide range of topics.
Your engagement fuels our commitment to delivering meaningful content from around the world. Until next time, take care.